Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in earlier lecture, we discussed the judicial review, the power of the Supreme Court and High Court to conduct the judicial review of administrative action and different grounds of judicial review. In continuation to the earlier lecture, in the present lecture, that is in our 14th session of the course of administrative law, we are going to discuss the modes of judicial review of administrative action. Though in the earlier lecture, we have discussed that what are the modes, I mentioned all the modes of judicial review of administrative action, wherein the High Courts and the Supreme Court of India can issue any directions or any orders, including the five kinds of writs to have or to conduct the judicial review over administrative action. In the present lecture, we will focus on all these five kinds of writs as the modes of judicial review of administrative action. These five modes of judicial review of administrative action are the five writs which the courts can grant at the time of making the judicial review of any administrative action are the writ of certiorari, the writ of prohibition, the writ of covaranto, the writ of mandamus and the writ of habeas corpus. In the present lecture, we are including only three writs, the writ of certiorari, the writ of prohibition and the writ of covaranto and the rest two writs we will discuss in the 15th lecture. As to the introduction to all these writs or the modes of judicial review, we can say that the judicial review has been well recognized as an essential element of basic structure of the constitution of India. And it cannot be taken away even by the power of amendment in the constitution. As we all know that the parliament has the power to amend the constitution under article 368 of Indian constitution. Under this power of parliament, the parliament can amend each and every part of Indian constitution. That power of parliament has been recognized as unlimited power, the plenary power of parliament, it is given by the constitution itself to the parliament to amend the constitution and therefore no limitations can be put on the authority of parliament to amend the constitution. Then the question arises whether the parliament can amend each and every part even the essential elements of Indian constitution and thus if it can destroy the basic structure this question was tackled by the Supreme Court of India in the case of Keswaran Bharti. And in Keswan and Varti case, the doctrine of basic structure was evolved. In accordance with the doctrine of basic structure, it was held by the Supreme Court that though the power of parliament to amend the constitution is unlimited, unrestricted, uncontrolled, it is plenary power, it is the constituent of power of parliament and article 368 gives both the procedure as well the power to parliament to amend the constitution, but this power of parliament under article 368, it is subject to the doctrine of basic structure and the what doctrine of basic structure means that the parliament cannot amend the basic features of Indian constitution, it cannot destroy the basic structure of Indian constitution by amending those elements which makes the foundation of the constitution of India. And therefore, the judicial review was also recognized as the part of basic structure 
of Indian constitution, even in the case of Keswanand Bharti by the Supreme Court of India, this power of judicial review cannot be taken away by any authority, including the parliament by way of amendment in the constitution. This shows, indicates the significance, the importance of the power of judicial review of the higher courts in India under our constitution. The power of judicial review is exercised by the Supreme Court and High Courts by way of issuing several rates under Article 32 and Article 226. It is also exercised by the Supreme Court under Article 136 and by the High Courts under Article 227. Article 13 also authorizes the Indian Higher Courts to exercise the power of judicial review. The authority of courts to exercise the power of judicial review is not only for the purpose of enforcement of fundamental rights and other legal rights of the people, but also to keep the administration within the limits of its powers and to put proper and effective control on it. It means that the power of judicial review has twofold objectives. The one objective of power of judicial review is the preservation, is the protection of the fundamental rights and other legal rights of the people of this country. Under Article 32, for the violation of any fundamental rights, the citizen can go to the Supreme Court directly for the enforcement of these fundamental rights. Under Article 226, the writ can be issued by the high courts for any violation of fundamental rights and also for any other purpose, meaning thereby that the first objective of the power of judicial review is to preserve and protect the fundamental rights and the legal rights of people of this country. The second objective, objective of judicial review is to have the proper control, to have an effective and efficient control over the powers of administration, so that the concept of the limitations over the government can be ensured. This aspect of judicial review that the judicial review has twofold functions, twofold objectives to protect the fundamental rights and legal rights of the individuals and to have the efficient and effective control over the powers of administration was recognized by the Supreme Court of India in the case of S. L. Kapoor versus Jagmohan, which was decided in 1980 by the Supreme Court. In this case, there was the argument that the petition has become infructuous and the court is not entitled to entertain the appeal. Against this argument, the Supreme Court has held that though the petitioner has lost his standing, though the petition has become infructuous, Yet, the court can still decide because the petition involves an issue of public importance, meaning thereby, even if the petition has become infectious, even if the petitioner has lost his standing before the court, he could not initiate the proceedings, he could not file the petition. But when the matter of public importance is involved, then the court can entertain the matter, the court can issue the writ, the court can have the judicial review even after this situation. This approach of the power of judicial review has become very significant and relevant in the light of the fact that in modern form of intensive government, there has been innumerable increase in the functions and powers of the government. And if these newly increased powers are properly exercised, these may create a real welfare state concept, but if these powers are allowed to be abused or to be used or exercised in arbitrary manner, these may create the possibility of totalitarian state and which goes against the basic spirit of Indian constitution, which goes against the basic spirit of rule of law, which goes against the basic spirit of the democratic pattern of government. So, for maintaining the sound and strong democracy, 
to maintain the rule of law, it is important that the power of judicial review should be given to the courts in such a manner. The traditional modes of judicial review are the five writs. These five writs are the writ of certiorari, the writ of prohibition, the writ of covarento, the writ of mandamus, and the writ of habeas corpus. The first writ amongst all is the writ of certiorari, which we are taking up. This writ of certiorari, if we see the origin of this writ of certiorari, we should understand first what does this term certiorari means. The term certiorari is derived from the Latin word certiorari, and this Latin word certiorari means to inform. It means that the writ of certiorari relates to some kind of information. Earlier in England, it was used for a royal demand to inform the king about some matter. That was in the form of royal demand, the demand of the crown to inform him about something, about some matter. But during the course of time, during the course of development, this started to be used for bringing for review an order of any inferior court, an order of any tribunal or administrative authority before the king's bench court. During this course of time and development, the king's bench court was given the authority, was given the jurisdiction to make the judicial review of the actions being taken by any inferior courts, any tribunal or any administrative authority. It is also important to note that the modern meaning to writ of certiorari was given by Lord Atkin in the case of electricity commissioner. This modern meaning to the writ of certiorari was recognized, was given, was propounded by Lord Atkin in the case of King versus electricity commissioners, which was decided in 1924 by the King's Bench Court. According to the meaning given by Lord Atkin to the writ of certiorari or to the term certiorari, he says that wherever any body of persons having any authority to determine the questions affecting the rights of the subjects and having the duty to act judicially acts in excess of its legal authority. It is subjected to the controlling jurisdiction of King's Bench Division exercised in this writ. This meaning which was attributed to the writ of Shashwari by Lord Atkin is very important for us to understand the essential elements of the writ of Shashwari, to understand the conditions on which the writ of Shashwari is issued by the courts. For any kind of writ, there is the need of the fulfillment of some conditions. There are some condition precedents on which the courts issue the writs and for Shashwari, these conditions can be understood or can be found in the meaning given by Lord Atkin. Again, we can see the meaning which was given by Lord Atkin in the case of electricity commissioner. According to that meaning, wherever any body of persons having any authority to determine the questions affecting the rights of the subjects and having the duty to act judicially acts in access of its legal authority. It is subjected to the controlling jurisdiction of King's Bench Division exercised in this writ. There are three important parts of this meaning given to the writ of Shashwari by Lord Atkin. Number one, wherever any body of persons having any authority to determine the questions, Affecting the rights, number two, affecting the rights of, what kind of questions? Affecting the rights of the subjects and then having the duty to act judicially. These are the three conditions. Number one, 
that there must be a body of persons having legal authority. Legal authority to what? The legal authority to determine the questions affecting the rights of the individuals, the rights of the people, the rights of the subjects. And then number three, having the duty to act judicially. It is also important for the writ of shashwari that body of persons must also have the duty or obligation to act judicially. If these three conditions are fulfilled, then the next condition is that that body of persons, that authority acts in the access of its legal authority. So, there must be a legal authority in the hands of the body of persons or the administrative body and it acts in the access of the authority given to it. If these conditions are fulfilled, then it is subjected to the controlling jurisdiction of King's Bench Division exercised in this writ. On the fulfillment of these conditions, the administrative body is subjected to the controlling jurisdiction is subjected to the review by the King's Bench Court which is exercised in this writ or in the writ of Shashwari. On the basis of this meaning or the analysis we are making of the meaning given by Lord Atkin, we can understand that what are the essential elements of writ of Shashwari. To point out the essential elements of writ of Shashwari, on the basis of the analysis of Lord Atkin's definition, Lord Atkin's formulation to the meaning of writ of Shashwari, we can say that the essential elements of writ of Shashwari are following. Number one, there must be a body of persons which have the legal authority to determine the questions. Number two, the determination of questions by the body of persons must affect the rights of the subjects, the rights of the individuals. And then that body of persons must be obliged to act in judicial manner. Then that body of persons acts in the access of its legal authority. If these four conditions are fulfilled, only then the writ of Shashwari is issued. In the case of R versus Church Assembly Legislative Committee, which was decided by the King's Bench Court again in 1928, Lord Hewart observed that this fourth condition that the body of persons or the administrative body must be obliged to act judicially is the additional requirement for the authority to act judicially for issue of the writ of Shashwari. So, for the issue of the writ of Shashwari, this is the additional condition in addition to earlier three conditions, it is an additional condition that that body must be obliged to or must have been obliged to act judicially. It is very important aspect of writ of Shashwari that the writ of Shashwari can be issued only when the legal authority, only when the administrative authority is obliged to act judicially. What does it mean? It means that the writ of Shashwari can be issued only against the judicial bodies and quasi-judicial bodies because only the judicial bodies and quasi-judicial bodies are obliged to act judicially or to act in judicial manner. The bodies which are purely administrative, which are administrative, simple and pure are not obliged to act judicially. Acting judicially means acting objectively, determining the matter only on the basis of the evidences and material, materials produced by the parties to the case before the authority and not any subjective element to be inputted in the decision by the authority. And therefore, according to that traditional meaning of writ of Shashwari as it was given by Lord Atkin uh, and as it was interpreted by Lord Hewart, the writ of Shashwari could be issued only against the judicial bodies and quasi-judicial bodies. That is the reason for which we have the perception that the writ of Shashwari 
is available or the writ of certiorari lies only against the courts, only against the tribunals, only against the judicial authorities, only against the quasi judicial authorities. The Indian courts also adopted the same approach for the issue of writ of certiorari because before the establishment of the Supreme Court of India or earlier before the establishment of the Federal Court in India, when Federal Court became the superior most court of appeal in India, the Privy Council was the superior most appellate court for India. And the decisions being given by the Privy Council, these were operating as the precedent or the established law for the Indian courts to adopt, for the Indian courts to follow. The Privy Council also adopted and confirmed the observation of Lord Hewart made in the case of R versus Church Assembly Legislative Committee. And it means that the Privy Council was also of the view that the writ of Shashori was available only against the judicial bodies and quasi judicial bodies. The same approach was adopted by the Indian courts, which was adopted and followed by the Privy Council in the case of Nakuda Ali versus Jayaratne in 1951. When the Indian courts adopted the same approach as it was adopted by the Privy Council and the English courts. It meant that the Indian courts were issuing the writ of shashwari only against the judicial and quasi-judicial bodies. But there was a development in the year of 1964 in English legal system with relation to the writ of shashwari. A very important case, which also a significant case for the application of principles of natural justice rule of hearing, the Ridge versus Waldwin. This Ridge versus Waldwin was decided by House of Lords. The House of Lords at that time was the superior most appellate court in England. As the Privy Council was the superior most appellate court for India or for all the colonies, the House of Lords was the superior most appellate court for Englishmen in England. That the superior most appellate court in England, that is the House of Lords, decided Ridge versus Waldwin case on the issue of the right to hearing or the rule of hearing audio term partum. And the decision which was taken by the administrative authority in violation of principles of natural justice was held wide by the House of Lords. In the same case, Lord Reed reinterpreted the additional requirement or the words of Lord Atkin in Electricity Commissioner case that is acting judicially. He interpreted the term acting judicially as acting fairly. When Lord Reed interpreted the word or the term acting judicially as acting fairly, it expanded the scope and ambit of writ of shashwari. So, in 1964, a great development was done with regard to the scope of writ of shashwari because though the judicial and quasi-judicial bodies are required to act judicially, but it is the obligation on each and every administrative authority whether it is exercising the quasi-judicial functions or not. Even it is the obligation over the administrative authorities pure and simple that these administrative authorities should act fairly. You can refer to the case of Menka Gandhi versus Union of India decided by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in Menka Gandhi case adopted same terminology as used by Lord read in the case of Ridge versus Waldwin, when the Supreme Court says that there must be fair 
play in action. Fair play in action means that the authority must act fairly. So, it is the obligation over each and every administrative body, whether it is exercising the judicial functions or judicial powers or not, that it must act fairly. When the words of Lord Atkin acting judicially were interpreted by Lord Reed in the case of Ridge versus Baldwin as acting fairly, it expanded the scope of writ of sorcery to include also within its ambit the purely administrative bodies, purely administrative authorities. The same interpretation which was made by Lord Reed in the case of Ridge versus Baldwin was adopted by the Supreme Court of India in the case of A.K. Krapak versus Union of India. A.K. Krapak versus Union of India was decided in 1969 by the Supreme Court. And in this case, the Supreme Court issued the writ of sociority against an interview committee, which was purely administrative body. So, when the writ of sociority was issued in India against an interview committee or the selection committee, then it seems that in India also, since Krapak case, a new trend has emerged in the expanding horizon of the writ of sociority. When the Indian Supreme Court adopted the interpretation by Lord Reed in Ridge versus Baldwin, it means that in India also, the writ of sociority became available against purely administrative bodies like the selection committees. And it created a new environment for the expanded scope and ambit of writ of sociality in India. To control the administrative actions, now the writ of sociality applies not only the legal authorities, not only to the judicial bodies, not only to quasi judicial bodies, but also to any agency or instrumentality of the state, to any administrative body who acts arbitrarily in violation of law or the constitution. This is the new trend with regard to the scope and ambit of writ of sociality. Now, we are turning to the grounds of writ of sociality. What are the grounds of writ of sociality? As we have seen, in the meaning of writ of sociality given by Lord Atkin, that if the body of persons acts in the axis of jurisdiction, in the axis of its legal authority, it means that the jurisdiction is the basic element, the jurisdiction is the basic ground for the issue of writ of sociality. So, the grounds of writ of sociality or the grounds on which the writ of sociality can be issued are number one, lack of jurisdiction, number two, the access of jurisdiction, number three, the abuse of jurisdiction, number four, the violation of principles of natural justice, the infringement of the fundamental rights, and one more ground that is the error of law committed by the authority in taking the action. If any error of law is committed by the authority in taking the action, it means that the authority is abusing the jurisdiction or it is lacking the jurisdiction or it is acting in the axis of jurisdiction. So, these are the grounds. Number one, the lack of jurisdiction. The lack of jurisdiction means or the ground of lack of jurisdiction may arise when the authority is improperly constituted. The authority lacks the jurisdiction means that the constitution of authority is not proper. It is constituted improperly. It is constituted in violation of the law or in violation of the procedure to constitute this authority. So, if the authority is constituted improperly, it is the instance of the lack of jurisdiction. Then, 
if the authority is constituted properly, but it assumes the jurisdiction by making the error in the decision on jurisdictional facts to which it never belonged. It assumes the jurisdiction, such a jurisdiction to which it never belonged by committing the error in interpreting the jurisdictional facts. We know that whenever any case comes before any court, before any authority, then the authority is first to see whether it has the legal authority or the jurisdiction to act on that matter or not, to make the decision on that issue or not, to determine that matter or not. If the authority wrongly interprets the jurisdictional facts and assumes such a jurisdiction to which it never belonged, then it is also the instance of the lack of jurisdiction. The lack of jurisdiction may also arise when the law which gives the jurisdiction to the authority is itself unconstitutional, invalid or illegal. So, when the law which gives the authority, which gives the jurisdiction to the administrative body, which gives the jurisdiction to the court, which gives the jurisdiction to the tribunal, which gives the jurisdiction to any judicial, quasi-judicial or administrative authority, is itself invalid law, unconstitutional law, then this is also the instance of the lack of jurisdiction. If the legal authority, the administrative body disregards very preliminary issues in making the decision, it is also the instance of lack of jurisdiction. You can refer to the cases like Rafiq Khan versus State of UP, Budh Prakash, Jay Prakash versus Sales Tax Officer, Nalini Ranjan versus Anand Sankar, HLGB Manufacturers versus Abdul Rashid. To understand that what constitutes the lack of jurisdiction for any any judicial, quasi judicial or administrative authority. The second ground is the access of jurisdiction. The ground of access of jurisdiction exists or it arises when though the authority has the jurisdiction to act, has the jurisdiction to give the decision to determine the matter, but it goes beyond the legal authority, it goes beyond the jurisdiction which has been conferred on it. You can refer to the case J.K. Chaudhary versus R.K. Dutt Gupta. In this case, the governing body of college affiliated to the Guwahati University dismissed the principal of the college. The executive council of the Guwahati University had the objections, had the representation made by the principal and after hearing the contentions, arguments and the representation by the principal of the college, the executive council ordered for reinstatement of the principal. This order was made by the executive council. The court issued the writ of shashorari to quash the order issued by the executive council. Because of the fact that section 21 of Guwahati University Act gives the jurisdiction to the university only to the teachers of the colleges and not to the matters relating to the principal of the college. But the Guwahati University gave the order to make the reinstatement of principal who was terminated by the college. Then the next ground is the abuse of jurisdiction. The abuse of jurisdiction, the ground of abuse of jurisdiction may exist or it may arise when the authority acts for improper purpose, it acts on some extraneous considerations, it acts in bad faith, it leaves some 
important or significant considerations to be included within the process of decision making. The ground of abuse of jurisdiction may also arise when the authority does not exercise the jurisdiction given to it by itself and delegates this authority to any other body or someone else. Violation of principles of natural justice, it is also a ground to issue the writ of statutory and the instances of the violation of principles of natural justice, we have discussed in very detail elaborately in earlier lectures. You can refer to the case of A.K. Krapak versus Union of India again for the issue of writ of statutory on the basis of the violation of principles of natural justice. For the violation of fundamental rights also, if the authority goes in the access of the jurisdiction given to it, the writ of statutory can be issued. The last ground for the issue of the writ of statutory is the error of law. The error of law which is made by the administrative body, any judicial body, quasi judicial body or the purely administrative body during the decision making process is also the ground on which the writ of statutory can be issued. Next is the writ of prohibition. If we try to understand the objective of the writ of prohibition, the writ of prohibition has the objective to direct the subordinate courts or tribunals to stop the proceedings before it or to do something which is prohibited by law. Generally, this writ is issued by the higher courts to the subordinate courts to prevent it from proceedings, further from conducting the proceedings, further with a case which does not come within its jurisdiction. The writ of provision may be issued in two forms, one the alternative writs and the other preemptory writs. Under alternative writs, the authority is directed to immediately act or desist and show cause why the directive should not be issued in the form of permanent writ. So, at first stage, the court may not issue the permanent writ. It may issue only the alternative writ to direct the authority to show cause why the permanent writ should not be issued and to direct the authority to stop the proceedings. Under the preemptory writ, the higher courts, the high court or the supreme court directs the subordinate authority to immediate act or desist and certify the compliance of the writ by returning it to the court with a certificate to that effect. The writ of prohibition is issued only when the proceedings are pending before the court or tribunal to stop the authority from continuing the proceeding. So, this is the difference in the writ of or the point of distinction in the writ of statutory and the writ of prohibition. That the writ of prohibition is issued when the proceedings are in continuance when the proceedings are continued. It cannot be issued when the proceedings have been terminated by the authority or the decision has been taken by the authority. At this stage when the uh, proceedings have been done and the decision has been made by the authority, the writ of statutory lies. So, the provision and statutory, these are two complementary writs. The person can pray for both the writs simultaneously in the same petition. But the writ of provision is issued when the proceedings are in continuation and the writ of statutory is issued when the decision has been taken. What are the grounds of the writ of prohibition? The grounds of writ of prohibition are the same on which the writ of statutory can be issued. These are the lack of jurisdiction, the access of jurisdiction, the abuse of jurisdiction, the violation of the principles of natural justice and the infringement of fundamental rights. This writ of prohibition is the writ wherein the alternative remedy cannot bar the right of the petitioner to get the remedy. 
in all other rates if the alternative remedies are not exhausted the court refuses to to issue the rate because it is the rule that first the petitioner should have exhausted all the alternative remedies and only then it can come to the court for the issue of the rates but the prohibition is the rate where the alternative remedies cannot war the court to issue the rate in the case of lakshmindra tirth swamier versus commissioner hindu religious endowments and the cases bengal immunity company limited versus state of bihar and tm monu samappa versus sons and custodians evacue property in the all these cases this aspect of rate of shashori was highlighted by the courts therefore this is the reason for which the rate of provision is called as it is considered to be the rate of right because the existence of alternate remedy cannot be the ground to refuse the rate then we are to discuss the next rate the rate of covarantu the literal meaning of covarantu is why what warrant of authority the rate of covarantu is issued by the supreme court or high court to ask any person that why what authority or what warrant he occupies or claims certain office or franchise or liberty this rate of shashori is issued when any person is alleged to usurp any office or franchise or liberty to which he is not entitled this is only the rate which is issued against an individual and not against the authority it is an efficient method to control the administrative authority who are authorized to make the appointments on public offices therefore we can summarize the objectives of the writ of covarantu what are the objectives of writ of covarantu number 1 to review the proceedings of those administrative authorities which are engaged or which are given the authority and responsibility to make the appointments to public offices number 2 to efficiently control the legislative executive statutory and non statutory authorities in the matters of public appointments and to hold illegal and quash such appointments which are made in violation and contravention of law number 3 to remove inefficient unqualified and unfit and unentitled persons from the public offices the last the most important objective of the writ of covarantu is to protect the interest of those persons who are deprived of a public office to which they are entitled so two important aspects of writ of covarantu are number 1 to remove such persons from the public offices who usurp the offices though they are not entitled they are not qualified to hold those offices and to protect the interest of those persons who are entitled to those public offices what are the grounds or what are the conditions on which the writ of covarantu may be issued the writ of covarantu may be issued on the condition on the fulfillment of the following conditions number 1 the writ of covarantu may be issued on the fulfillment of the following conditions number 1 the office must be a public office number 2 the public office must be a substantive in nature number 3 the person must be in actual possession of the public office and number 4 the public office must be held in contravention of law the first condition to the writ of co warranto is that the office must be the public office which offices are public office it is the matter of interpretation in different cases the different kind of offices have been declared to be the public offices public offices are the offices where the 
bodies or the officials or the administrative authorities, they do the public acts or by the activities of which the public rights may be affected. In the case of Anand Vihari versus Ram Sahai, the office of the Speaker of Legislative Assembly was declared to be the public office by the Madras High Court. In the case of G.D. Karkare versus Shevdi, the office of Advocate General was declared to be the public office by the Nagpur High Court in 1952. In the case of Sam Sundar versus State of Punjab, the office of the members of Municipal Corporation, Parshad, that was considered to be the public office. The offices of the university officials have also been considered or recognized to be the public offices. The second important ground or the condition on fulfillment of which the writ of co warranto is issued is that that public office must be substantive in nature. The public office must be substantive in nature refers to the permanency of public office. That the public office must be independent of, must have the independent existence or the existence independent of its holders. The public office must be in permanent nature. It must have the independent status or the status independent of its holders. In the case of R versus Spear, which was decided by the King's Bench Court in England in 1916, the substantive office was interpreted as the office independent of title. It means that the writ may be granted to the holders of those offices also, which are at the bill, which are continued or the tenure of those offices is dependent of the bill. Though the office must be substantive in nature would mean that it would have some permanent character and it should not be terminable at the bill of others. But if the office has the independent title or independent status or the status independent of its holder, then even against that office, which are at the termination of which at the bill of others may also be issued. We know the fact that there are various important offices which are at the bill of the President of India or at the bill of tenure of which depends on the bill of President of India or the governors of the state. So, these offices are the offices against which the writ of covaranto against holders of which the writ of covaranto may be issued. The third condition is that the person must be in actual position of office. The writ of covaranto is issued against those persons only who are in actual position of the office. For example, if some selections are made, some appointments are made to any public office, but the appointments have been made, the selection committee has been conducted, the results have been declared and the list of selected candidates have been displayed. But the person who was selected could not or he did not join the office at. At this very stage, the rate of covaranto cannot be issued because the person must be in actual possession of the office until and unless he joins the office, he takes the charge of the office, the writ of covaranto cannot be issued, the writ of covaranto does not lie. This aspect of or this important element or the condition of the writ of covaranto was pointed out by the Calcutta High Court in the case of Puranlal versus P.C. Ghosh. The office must be held in the contravention of law. Under this ground, it is important for us to know that only for some procedural irregularities, the writ of covaranto does not lie. 
the writ of covenant lies only when the person is appointed in contravention of law mere irregularities are not the condition for the issue of the writ of covenant then the question of locus standi arises that who can apply for the writ of certiorari before discussing the issue or the matter of locus standi or the standing for the writ of covenant it would be important to refer to the case of state of assam versus ranga mohammed which was decided by the supreme court in 1967 and in this case the court found the transfer and posting of two district judges contrary to the law but did not issue the co warrant to writ because it was a case of mere irregularity that did not make the occupation of office wrongful and therefore mere irregularity is not the ground on which the writ of certiorari may be issued but if the matter of the violation of fundamental rights is involved in the writ the writ can be issued only for the mere irregularities as to the locus standi or standing we can understand that the writ of covenant relates to the public offices and each and every person has the locus to those public offices and therefore the writ of covenant can be issued any person can go for or can request for the issue of writ of covenant whether his right was infringed or not for all other rights the person has the locus the person has the standing to go to the court for the demand of the particular writ only when his particular right has been infringed but the writ of covenant can be sought by any person irrespective of the fact that his right is infringed or not so this is the position of the locus standi or this is the position of standing of a person to request for the writ of covenant in the present lecture we discussed the three modes of the judicial review of administrative action the writ of certiorari the writ of prohibition and the writ of covenant in the next lecture we will discuss the remaining two writs the writ of mandamus and the writ of habeas corpus thank you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Today we are going to read a section from Virginia Woolf's novel Orlando. And the section that we are going to listen to today is perhaps one of the finest descriptions of the winter season in English literature. It is also a very fine piece of what we call fantasy writing. I have made a few changes to the original to adapt it for the purpose of reading. The great frost was, historians tell us, the most severe that has ever visited these islands. Birds froze in mid-air and fell like stones to the ground. At Norwich, a young countrywoman started to cross the road in her usual robust health and was seen by the onlookers to turn visibly to powder and be blown in a puff of dust over the roofs. The mortality among sheep and cattle was enormous. Corpses froze and could not be drawn from the sheets. It was no uncommon sight 
to come upon a whole herd of swine frozen immovable upon the road. The fields were full of shepherds, plowmen, teams of horses and little birds carrying boys all struck stark in the act of the moment. One with his hand to his nose, another with a bottle to his lips, a third with a stone raised to throw at the ravens who sat upon the hedge within a yard of him as if they were stuffed birds. The severity of the frost was so extraordinary that a kind of petrification sometimes ensued. It was commonly supposed that the great increase of rocks in some parts of Derbyshire was due to no eruption, for there was no eruptions. Rather, it was supposed that they were due to the solidification of unfortunate wayfarers who had been turned literally to stones where they stood. The church could give little help in the matter, and though some landowners had these relics blessed, the most part preferred to use them either as landmarks, scratching posts for sheep, or when the form of the stone allowed, drinking troughs for cattle, which purpose they serve admirably for the most part to this day. But while the country people suffered the extremity of want and the trade of the country was at a standstill, London enjoyed a carnival of utmost brilliance. The new king directed that the reef river, which was frozen to a depth of 20 feet, should be swept, decorated and given all the semblance of a park or pleasure ground, with arbors, mazes, alleys, drinking booths, all at his expense, of course. Frozen roses fell in showers when the queen and her ladies walked abroad. Colored balloons hovered motionless in the air. Here and there burnt vast bonfires of cedar and oak wood, lavishly salted so that the flame were of green, orange and purple fire. But however fiercely they burnt, the heat was not enough to melt the ice, which, though of singular transparency, was yet of the hardness of steel. So clear, indeed, was the ice that there could be seen congealed at a depth of several feet, here a porpoise, there a flounder. Shoals of eels lay motionless in a trance, but whether their state was one of death or merely of suspended animation, which uh, the warmth would revive, puzzled the philosophers. In short, nothing could exceed the brilliancy and gaiety of the scene by day. But it was at night that the carnival was at its merriest. The nights were of perfect stillness. The moon and stars blazed with the hard fixity of diamonds, and to the fine music of flute and trumpet the courtiers danced. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.